Okay, welcome to our webinar for a certified fire protection specialist exam preparation. And I'm <clears throat> your instructor. My name is Marvin. I am a certified fire protection specialist. So now let us start about the, the topic confining fires. In this module, we will review and analyze the interaction between the interior elements and the building design. We also try to explore the role in the containment of fire within the compartment of origin. We also try to explore the construction feature, building environment and confinement technique to slow the fire spread. And once, if, once we complete, completed the module, we'll be able to recall all the topics related to section 18 of your fire protection handbook, explain how fire resistance rating are calculated, describe the role of elements in the confinement of fire, and summarize the design technique available to assess structural fire resistance. In this module, uh, we will uh, uh, hear from Christine, uh, the power protection engineer of NPA, and uh, she will explain how to calculate the fire load. And Dwayne Sloan will also discuss the use of stainer, <coughs> stainer tunnel test to predict the behavior of internal interior finished product in the fire. We'll also discuss uh, uh, the relevant section of chapter 18, uh, confinement of fire in the building, interior finish, smoke movement, penetration ceiling, and deflagration, venting. And uh, let us start confinement of fire discussion in the building. The MGM Grand Fire occurred in 1980 at the MGM Grand Hotel and Casino in Las Vegas, Nevada. The fire killed 85 people, most through smoke inhalation. The tragedy remains the deadliest disaster in Nevada history. In its final report, the Clark County Fire Department concluded that the fire had started in a concealed space near a pie case in the deli restaurant. The most probable cause, an electrical ground fault. The fire smoldered for a time and broke out into the deli, where it quickly spread, feeding on combustible contents and interior finishes. When fire broke out into the casino, it fed on a massive fuel load of furniture, decorations, and gambling paraphernalia, spreading the fire with such force and speed that it blew out the hotel doors and spread to the port cochere. The fire was largely confined to the casino level and brought under control by 8.30 in the morning but it released immense quantities of highly toxic smoke. Design, construction, and maintenance factors contributed to the smoke spread to the high-rise. For example, seismic joints, open shafts designed for earthquake protection, which extended from above the casino ceiling to the top of the high-rise, spread the smoke upward, as did stairways and elevator hoistways. Smoke spread into corridors and reached air conditioning units on the roof which were not equipped with smoke detectors to shut the systems down. The smoke was recycled back down shafts and into the corridors. It migrated into guest rooms through fan coil units and around doors. Smoke also spread up plumbing chases and bathroom vents. The fire in the MGM Grand Hotel was a unique incident. The fire developed rapidly in a large undivided area and spread smoke throughout the high rise. Exit stairways, which should have assisted evacuation, filled with smoke. What should have provided safe passage became untenable.
Fire load is an important factor to consider when determining the parameters of a design fire. The design fire is used in fire risk analysis and fire modeling of a building, often when using a performance-based design approach. With a prescriptive design approach, understanding the fire load will help the engineer decide on what design scheme to select. For example, when designing a sprinkler system for a storage facility, the engineer must understand the fire load potential of the commodities being stored. Fire load is generally expressed as the total weight of combustibles divided by the fire area. Typically, plastics and other high hazard combustibles are converted to an equivalent weight of ordinary combustibles with an assumed heat of combustion of 8,000 BTUs per pound. This allows a designer to compare fire loads that include various different mixes of combustible materials. Let's look at an example that shows the conversion of a higher combustible to an equivalent weight of ordinary combustibles. The equivalent weight of 10 pounds per square foot of a plastic with a heat of combustion of 12,000 BTUs per pound would be as follows. 10 pounds per square foot multiplied by 12,000 BTU per pound results in 120,000 BTUs per square foot. This first step in the calculation represents the total weight of the combustibles divided by the fire area, which is the 10 pounds per square foot in the fuel load, multiplied by the heat of combustion of the plastics of 12,000 BTUs per pound, giving us 120,000 BTUs over the square foot. The next step in the calculation is to take that 120,000 BTUs per square foot and divide it by 8,000 BTUs per pound for the ordinary combustibles conversion, resulting in a total of 15 pounds per square foot as the equivalent weight of plastic with a heat of combustion of 12,000 BTUs per pound. Okay, so the calculation is uh, relatively simple, and this is the uh, the case study. You are let's walk through a calculation together, and you are evaluating the fire load for a ten square foot uh, storage closet where the owner is storing hundred fifty pounds of paraffin wax. If the paraffin wax has a heat of combustion of 19,875 BTU per pounds. What is the equivalent weight of the farpin wax as an ordinary combustible? Okay, so the first step in calculation represents the total weight of the combustible divided by uh, the fire area. And we will calculate this in pounds per square foot. No? So you are getting the 150 pounds divided by 10 square feet. So you will get 15 pounds per square foot. Okay. Or 73.1 kilograms per square meter. The next step in calculation is to use the fuel load figure in the average load calculation. Okay, and the answer, we will uh, multiply the 15 pounds per square meter by 19,875 BTU per pound. So you will get BTU per square foot, about 298,125 BTU per square foot. And the last step is to convert this figure to the equivalent weight of ordinary combustible. And uh, please round up to the nearest ten after the decimal. And according to page 11, page 18-5 of your fire protection handbook, the equivalent combustible weight is defined as the weight of ordinary combustible having a heat of combustion of 8,000 BTU per pound that would release the same total heat as the combustible in the space. So that 298,125 BTU per square feet will be divided into 8,000. So we will get 37.3 pounds per square foot. Okay. 
the burning rate is uh, fully de of the uh, of uh, the fully developed fire depends on the air and fuel available for combustion. When an ample air is available, the burning rate of the fire depends on the following surface area and the properties of a combustible fuel. Fire spread really occur by heat transfer through or structural failure of wall, floor or ceiling assembly. The common mode of fire spread in a compartment building is through, just remember this in your exam, how the spread, how the fire spread commonly in a compartmented building, open door, unenclosed stairway. So again, if we will use the stairway as a means of ingress, it's supposed to be uh, fire rated. No? Unprotected penetrations of fire separations, the shaft, shafts, and non-fire stop combustible concealed spaces. Okay. <clears throat> The way fire moves through a building are through concealed space, the vertical opening or shafts, through corridors. So that's why the corridor should be also fire rated or at least smoke resistance if there is a sprinkler. And uncompartmented space. So that's why even uncompartmented space, we should not go more than, so let's say about 3,000 square foot or 9,000 square foot depends on the classification. So let's check in your uh, knowledge, what you have gained so far. Which of this low, which of this room has the lowest mean fire load for an office building? And you can go to page 18, the six table 18.1.2 of your fire protection handbook. So I already provided the extracted section of this. So based on the table 18.1.2, the answer is the government office conference room. Again, according to the table 18.1.2 of your fire protection handbook, the government office conference room have the lowest mean fire load. Now let's talk about interior finish and the impact of uh, interior finishes. Building interior finishes, principally wall and ceiling lining can have a major impact on both the fire growth and the ultimate size of the fire. Section 18, chapter two. In the fire protection handbook, address interior finishes. Interior wall and ceiling lining may act like fuse, spreading flame away from the fire origin to the involved other object. This causes the fire, fire to grow to a large size. Interior finishes may also provide a large unbroken surface over which flame spread as a flame spread to involve greater surface area a fire rate of heat release can increase thus increase the fire size if the interior finish exhibits poor fire resistance the flame may release sufficient energy to cause the formation of hot gas layer Combustible interior finish, such as low density fiberboard, uh, might have some impact as well on the uh, as part of the interior finishes. So the ceilings or the <coughs> excuse me, the floor ceiling and the, the walls. Okay, and this uh, wallpaper or textile wall covering.
wood panel. Okay. And combustible floor covering have been found in the past. Remember guys, the floor covering found to be significant factor in many major fire, including some that became multiple death fire. In recent year, there have been fewer cases where interior finish has led to fire fatality or death, but this is still a major fire problem. Several tests have been developed to try to predict the behavior of interior finished product in a fire. And let's learn about one of them. And there is a video transcript from Mr. Dwayne to explain about the Stainer Tunnel test. Several tests have been developed to try to predict the behavior of interior finished products in a fire. Let's learn about one of them. The Steiner Tunnel, named in honor of Al Steiner, is a furnace chamber that measures flame spread and smoke development. The furnace cavity measures 18 inches wide by 12 inches deep by 25 feet long, and it has windows along the length for observation of the flame. Samples can be tested up to a thickness of approximately 5 to 6 inches. Two burner outlets spaced eight inches apart deliver a nominal 5,000 BTU per minute, four and a half foot flame, to provide the ignition source to the underside of the mounted specimen. The test continues for a 10 minute duration. A controlled inlet draft of 240 feet per minute facilitates a horizontal flame propagation throughout the test. At the end of the tunnel, there's a light and photoelectric cell mounted in the exhaust duct. This records how much the light is obscured by smoke during the test. We take care to clean the glass and equipment so that we get true readings due to the burning of the sample. Here we are loading the test samples. The test is conducted with the sample mounted in the sealing position of the tunnel. Samples are expected to be representative of the materials intended to be installed in the field. For example, these test samples are three quarter inch fire retarded treated plywood. The sample size are between 20 and 24 inches wide and 24 feet long, spanning the entire length of the tunnel. These sample lengths may be either continuous, unbroken length, or most often they're eight foot sections that are joined and butted end to end. When the removable lid is raised, we load the specimens in place as quickly as practical. Then the lid is lowered back into position over the specimen. With all the controls set for the tunnel operation, the room is darkened and the gas burners are ignited. Observers record the distance and time of maximum flame front travel through the tunnel observation windows. Flame front advancement is recorded at the time of occurrence or at least every 30 seconds, if no advancement is noted. The test continues for 10 minutes and the photoelectric cell outputs are recorded immediately prior to the beginning of the test and every two seconds during the entire test. When the test is ended, the gas supply is shut off and the lid is raised for removal of the samples. The samples are removed and hosed down as necessary. As we heard, the Steiner tunnel test is used to calculate the flame spread index of an interior wall or ceiling finish material and the results of the Steiner tunnel test provides the classifications for interior wall and ceiling finished materials. Materials are divided into class A, B, C and the flame spread indices provide an information on the rate of flame spread across the surface of the material. It transfer is the principal hazard associated with the flame spread. Okay, so here the smoke develop just make some sort of correction, no? zero to uh, 25, 26 to 75, and 76 to 200. And the smoke develop in this determine material behavior in terms of light obscuration and loss of visibility of smoke. The smoke level will depend on both time and rate of smoke production and the material that has low smoke developed index will be selected to maintain visibility in a grease path for a longer period of time than a material with high smoke 
developing of course law obscuration of light and uh, higher visibility uh, lower visibility means the smoke develop index is high okay other fire tests determine flammability and fire performance of floor covering and other interior finishes and let's check our knowledge again in uh, according to the fire protection handbook what are the interior wall and ceiling finish requirements for the exit access corridor in an existing and sprinkled educational occupancy if you will go to chapter 18-28 page sorry page 18-28 of your fire protection handbook table 18.2.1 you'll be able to know that the answer pertains to class a or b again you can check later according to table 18.2.1 of your fire protection handbook the class a or b interior wall and ceiling finishes are required for excess access corridor existing educational occupancy now let's talk about smoke movement smoke as what we know is inherent in all fire contain dangerous product of combustion that have critical influence on life safety of the occupant and uh, might cause uh, might affect the property protection and operation by firefighter in the building section 18 chapter 3 in the fire protection handbook provides info on the technique used to evaluate the physical characteristics of smoke and assess its movement through the buildings. The smoke moves from area of high pressure to low pressure and a pressure difference from one space to another may be caused by buoyancy from the fire, stack effect, wind and forces from the building, HBC system. So that's why in our, in some, you know, there's a, uh, means of egress like corridor or uh, exit stair normally we provide pressurization in order to uh, mitigate or prevent you know, the contamination of smoke which might obscure the uh, <coughs> uh, the means of uh, escape the other factor that affect the smoke movement include the temperature of smoke the height of the building involved and the existence of opening in the building where multiple effects are present smoke movement will depend on a combination of numerous factors and let us discuss now the smoke production and hazard the smoke can adversely affect people and property as we discussed earlier in addition to a reduction in visibility and light, light due to light obscuration for example the smoke can resort in an exposure to toxic gas, elevated temperature, or radiant energy. The volume of combustion product contained in a rising plume is relatively small compared to the volume of air in a total mixture. <clears throat> Consequently, the volume of smoke produced by a fire approximates the volume of the air drained in the rising plume and we discussed many times now what is the plume area no? and the term smoke management includes all method that can be used alone in a combination to modify the smoke movement for the benefit of occupants or firefighter and can reduce the property damage compartmentation smoke dilution no? airflow away from those means of escape pressurization of our means of escape and the buoyancy of the smoke can be used to manage the hazard of smoke in fire okay so this is a typical example of a, of a pressurization fan centrifugal fan used for pressurization uh, through the shaft duct or through the duct shaft and uh, there's a ducting 
that uh, provides the airflow. Okay. <clears throat> and uh, let us discuss the, the penetration ceiling, which is also a major cause of, you know, fire spread and uh, smoke spread in the building. And, you know, the current standard is inspired by the Brown Ferry Nuclear Plant Fire in 1975. Uh, this nuclear power plant demonstrated that building construction must be properly sealed to limit the spread of both fire and smoke because material used before 1975 is to seal penetration were found to be inadequate new sealing materials develop a series of tests are also developed for the reading and use of this material in combination with the various fire fire barrier construction. And there are three categories of penetration ceiling. Number one, through penetration part stop, it is used to seal the opening where mechanical or electrical system pass through the rated wall or floor. Number two, perimeter fire containment system, used to seal opening between floor and the curtain wall and the joint system used to seal opening where two elements of construction come together, such as joint where two walls meet or well two different floor system meet. The first step to determine the proper first step method to be used is to identify the location of the fire barrier and the hourly hourly rating in the new construction project these are generally shown in architectural drawing or in case where a fire protection engineer is part of the design team maybe a separate set of uh, uh, fire barrier drawing may be provided which shows the location in the hourly rating and in existing construction there may be little or no guidance from the drawing. It will be necessary to study the building and the lo local building code to determine the location of the fire barrier. Once the required hourly rating for the true penetration parcel system has been determined, the search for specific system begins. Let us discuss the part stop selection. There are three elements for the part stop system selection. That's what you see on your screen. Fire barrier, penetrating item, and the part stop product. They have to work together, those three systems, to form a system that makes up the, the true penetration part stop and the testing lab lists thousands of systems, each of which is specific to a type of construction, hourly rating, and manufactured products. Let us discuss now the explosion venting. And the explosion venting is according to NPA 68 and 69, the two standard address, again, the protection for explosion and deflagration. And the PA68 is a standard on explosion protection by deflagration venting in NAPA69 referred to the standard on explosion prevention system. The flagration developed with a combustion reaction front propagates through a premixed fuel air mixture at a velocity less than the speed of sound in an unburned mixture. So probably it, it, it if this will come in your exam, the progression fuel air mixture less than the speed of sound. Detonation occur when the reaction rate exceeded the speed of sound and explosion when develop of internal pressure from the progression burst or rupture and enclosure or container. So there is an enclosure container possibility of explosion. 
In this module, we'll discuss the progression bend, which relieves the overpressurization in a safe way. The deflagration suppression system, which prevents explosion, suppressing the deflagration before the developed pressure exceeds the strength of the closure. And that are not covered in this module. Explosion band is a damage limiting protection technique. It is intended to protect an enclosure against damaging pressure generated by deflagration within the enclosure by safely venting the pressure to a safe location. Section 18, Chapter 6, discuss the design technique used to accomplish the objective. Deflagration is a propagation of combustion zone from the ignition point at less than the speed of sound Again, as what we discussed earlier in the unreacted medium. So let us watch a video, a transcript pertaining to deprogression or explosion venting. Explosion venting is a damage. Explosion venting is a damage limiting protection technique. It is intended to protect an enclosure against damaging pressures generated by a deflagration within the enclosure by safely venting the pressures to a safe location. Section 18, Chapter 6, discusses the design techniques used to accomplish this objective. Deflagration is the propagation of a combustion zone from the ignition point at less than the speed of sound in the unreacted medium. This short video provides a general explanation of this method of confining fire. When a spark or other ignition source ignites particulate in a vessel, a fireball develops as material burns and grows at an exponential pace. The pressure front expands as the fireball grows, reaching the explosion vent. The explosion vent opens at a specified pressure, limiting the stress on the vessel and allowing it to maintain structural integrity while also releasing the pressure and allowing the fireball to vent into a safe area outside the facility. Alternatively, when the process cannot be vented safely outside, the explosion vent opens and directs the fireball into a flameless venting device. The flames are extinguished as they pass through the flame arresting screens, allowing pressure release but preventing dangerous flames from entering the work area, protecting personnel, and preventing secondary explosions. Explosion venting is a damage limiting protection technique. It is intended to protect an in section 18 less than the speed of sound in the unreacted medium. This short video provides. So let's let's check our knowledge. Okay, you can use our chat box if you want to participate. Methods of smoke management include which of the following? Okay, select all, apply. You can go to page 46, 8N 18-50 to 18-53 of your fire protection handbook. So the answer is, no, uh, ACD, okay, correct, Mr. Rahil, compartmentation, dilution, and pressurization, and may also include no other thing like airflow and buoyancy of the smoke. And uh, this is the module for today, and uh, provide a high level overview of the topics related to section 18 of the power protection handbook. We discover how the fire load and the fire resistibility impact the fire resistance rating and reviewed how the fire resistance ratings are calculated. Interior finish, particularly on the wall and ceiling of the building have a major impact on both the fire growth and the ultimate size of fire. We heard from Dwayne Sloan explained what is the Steiner tunnel test and how this affects the classification of these interior finishes. 
We also became familiar with the characteristic of smoke movement and the methods of smoke management. We were also introduced to the penetration and sealing and fire barriers. And lastly, we saw the demonstration of deflagration venting and how it can be used to limit the damage from the combined fires. So now let us uh, go to your quiz. Let me check how many questions are there. I think there are only 10. So we can uh, finish early today. Okay, now I provided the link and you can start answering now.
Okay. Let us resume by answering the... So first of all, I've seen the results of the quizzes. And uh, so far, no? uh, Mr. Joseph Mar again uh, got a perfect score, 100%. Mr. Brian, 100%, and Mr. Riyas, 93.75%, okay? Anyway, which five stop method is employed? Curtain wall, page 50, for our, of our handout. Perimeter fire containment system. Healthcare occupancy, have an additional requirement for smoke barrier to separate the floor. The smoke barriers must carry a blank one hour fire resistance rating according to 18-74 of your fire protection handbook. The resource from which test is location of interior wall and ceiling. Steiner tunnel test, page 35 of our lecture. Venting through roof openings can do which of the following select and all apply. Page 18-57, mitigate accumulation of heat and smoke, provide occupants with opportunity to travel to safety, and enable firefighter the chance to reach the seat of the fire. Which occupancies does NPA 101 permit Class A interior wall and ceiling finishes? You have to go to the same table we discussed earlier, 18-21. Of fire protection handbook, new hotel and dormitory, and assembly. Which of the typical fire load of containments in a dining room? Page 8-6, table 